I am Sue O'Connell. Thanks for joining us today. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but the votes were cast, the winner's been selected, and the oath of office has been taken. Joe Biden, officially president of the United States. Breaking news. But look, at, we're only two days into the Biden administration. But the folks at Frontline have been covering Biden's political career so closely that we may already have an idea of what the next 1400 days will look like. Now, you saw Frontline's The Choice before the 2020 election, but they're back now with a closer look into the life and mind of President Joe Biden with their newest film, President Biden. Frontline director Michael Kirk is gonna be joining me in just a second to talk about the film. But first, here's a taste of President Biden. As the nation reckons with the assault on democracy. One of the darkest days in the history of our nation. Frontline tells the story of America's next president. This man who's wanted to be president for half a century and failed and now finds himself at this moment of really abject national crisis. That's when the country sees him for the first time. It will test every bit of what Joe Biden has learned over nearly 50 years in public office. Now streaming on PBS. The director of President Biden and frontline filmmaker, Michael Kirk, is here. Welcome back to Lunch Hour Live, Michael. Always great to be with you, Sue. So, um, you know, I, I'm 59, and I think Joe Biden has been in office almost my entire life, <laughs> life right? He has been on my radar since I was a, a young adult. Um, and I often wonder, is there anything more I can know about Joe Biden? And in fact, there is. And you've had this unique opportunity to look at the lives of our former presidents and then tell their life story to millions of viewers, some of whom were not paying as much attention as you and I might be. Um, with all that said, um, who is the Joe Biden that comes out of the film? Who will people meet? Yeah, yes, he, he's not Sleepy Joe. Uh, you know, he's not Uncle Joe. Uh, he's a, he, he is the arc of his ambition and his uh, mistakes are all right out there in front for everybody to see. When you have a career over 50 years in politics uh, with cameras covering you and lots of members of the national press, you've run for president three times. Uh, you're bound to have all your uh, dirty laundry hanging on the line to be examined by people like me. But also there's a kind of, there's a thing about Biden, which is really amazing, which is his willingness to admit his mistakes, his apologies, which always are forthcoming. And then this strong desire to persevere in the face of adversity. And I'm, I'm, I'm not really reciting a commercial for Joe Biden as much as I'm doing a description of his actual uh, actions. Uh, that's the Joe Biden I didn't really know. Uh, and where does it all come from? That was my first question when my team and I went in to try to make the film. And also, uh, we were making the film at a time of great crisis in America. So we picked sort of six crisis points in Joe Biden's life to see how he reacts under real uh, self-imposed, in a lot of ways, uh, a problem that, uh, that happens and some that uh, are just horrible things that happened to him to uh, yield the composite of the man who we saw on that uh, on that uh, uh, in front of those microphones and up in, on the west side of the of the uh, uh, capital yesterday afternoon yeah i want to talk to you a bit about the the filmmaking process if you will because again he's had a long very public career with lots of documentation uh you know almost from his very first steps and when he ran for office as an in high school. Um, and, you know, obviously each of us is complicated and have nuanced uh, lives and need context in order to make sure we're not just reduced to, well, this happened and then that happened. Right. When you're looking at, you know, and, and this is not just for the Biden film, but for all of your filmmaking, when you're looking at this vast amount of uh, narrative opportunity, what do you decide? How do you decide which stories to get told? Do you try to sew them together or do you just look to see what rises to the top? Well, so there's some basic givens when you make a film like The Choice or the President Biden film. We don't interview the actual candidate or the person. So we didn't interview Joe Biden. We never want to. You've heard from Joe Biden. You know what his sanitized and completely glamorized version of 
life would be thanks to people who have worked to help him uh, create that, uh, uh, marketers and otherwise. But you, we talked to the people who were as close as we can get, wife, sister, brothers, staff that have been with him forever. Uh, and, and what are we seeking? We're seeking an understanding of what we call the life method. What does Joe Biden do every time he confronts something uh, that sticks with him, some things he discards, some things he keeps with him. But what is the essential Joe Biden life method, mistakes, apologies, perseverance, other things? Uh, and where do they come from? Answering the question uh, in the beginning of, is the boy the father of the man? So you've got to start all the way back when somebody's about seven years old and work your way up. We we did it with Donald Trump uh, in 16 and again now, but really Biden's uh, life story was, was uh, especially uh, interesting because it's so starkly filled with crisis and, and, his, and, and the way that he develops a method to be whoever Joe Biden has emerged to be now. One of the emerging stories during the campaign, and something that I knew about, but it wasn't um, very clear to folks, was that growing up, and still, Joe Biden uh, had a stutter. Uh, and obviously, in those days, uh, the years that he was born, that would really be a, a non-starter for a political career. But it interestingly turned out to be the thing that launches it. We're going to take a look at a clip from the film and come back and talk about it. Great. Joey Biden found another way to fight back, politics. In high school, he's president of his senior class. Um, honestly, that's when he gets a taste for it. The stutter is still part of him um, during his senior year in high school, um, where he has to introduce his family at, the, at, the, at graduation, and he has to... Uh, stand up there and not stutter and say this publicly and he does it in the crisis of stuttering a life method persevere just push through or in medical research to conquer to conquer devastating diseases like cancer and not the end in, in themselves in themselves uaw took incredible cuts in their future many people would say Biden's a stutter is among his most visible weaknesses, if not number one. But it's also a source of his a strength. It's also the main source of his grit and his determination to just be there competing. That's, uh, that was John Hendrickson, right, from uh, The Atlantic magazine who wrote a story earlier uh, last year about Joe Biden's stutter, which some people accused it of being this sort of whitewashing Joe's inability to get President Biden to get some words out from time to time. It's amazing to me that in um, Joe Biden's bravery in um, confronting his stutter, he has now as president of the United States actually normalized a stutter in a way that I think activists have been trying to do for a long time. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, did, is the stutter sort of the, the, the foundation for the way Joe approaches, citizen Joe approached life and then politician Joe and president Joe will approach the challenges that he sees? Well, that's right, Sue. The uh, you can imagine what it was like in the uh, uh, mid nineteen fifties. Uh, we were not hip to the idea that you know people with physical and other challenges uh, deserve our respect. And uh, a, a little boy growing up in Hard Scrabble, Scranton, and then uh, you know in in uh, Delaware, uh, bullied, made fun of, mocked, afraid. Even the nuns at his school kind of making fun of him, at least one. You know, it, it as John Hendrickson said, uh, I think unbelievably 
effectively. This is the source of a guy who will then run for president three times after being humiliated twice uh, in the process of running. He still comes back and he still goes older than any other presidential uh, uh, asp- uh, 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 person who wins the presidency. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it was a really, I mean, I just thought of it as this, uh, when I read that story and then I started to spend time and I'd been around Biden a little bit and I'd seen it sort of manifest itself just a little ways. Uh, but you can tell that he's always thinking about what he's doing. And every speech he gives, as I watch it now, even yesterday, I was waiting for the stutter, watching for the bypass strategy to get beyond certain words. He marks up a speech in a certain way. Uh, and rather than it being a deficiency, obviously, he has turned it, like he has done so many other things that happened in his life, into a, uh, in, into a, a positive. And he's he's worked with other people and help them uh, uh, live with their stutters and uh, overcome them. Uh, And we found many cases. I thought, well, maybe it's just one and it's a whatever, but you know, he's, he's on it. He's, that's who he has become in life. Yeah. It's often, I I have to say with the case with president Biden, you think it's going to be just one. And then it turns out to be 300. I'm finding with almost every topic. I want to talk about his political career because one of the things that I, enjoy when I when I watch um, recent history and watching uh, the, the, the your film is that um, I hadn't really watched anything about the Anita Hill hearings. Um, I can't even tell you when I looked at any video of it. In my emotional memory of Joe Biden during that time, Senator Biden, who was running the committee, was that he was disinterested in um, what Anita Hill was saying, and he was disinterested and apathetic about the process. Then watching your film, um, I come away thinking he was incredibly uncomfortable and uh, in a box uh, between what he could and couldn't do. Um, And I'm wondering when you go back to look at the footage or to examine these issues, any of the, the baggage that Joe Biden has, do you have to kind of go with it with a with an open mind and a blank slate so that you can see the story emerge or or what? You, um, I've been doing this a long time. And one of the things that you learn as you go along, you're sort of doing journalism, but biography at the same time. Most of the films I make are very character driven. So I've got to spend time with characters. And one of the things you, you learn is that um, you have to try to put them in the moment that it's happening and what were all the things around it. He was surrounded by white men, men of the Senate, as they were called in the Anita Hill moment. He's the leader of those men, all white men. Again, the voters had chosen them. Uh, They hadn't chosen uh, other people because other people hadn't been allowed to run in a lot of cases. He's got on one hand, he's got Ted Kennedy on the left and all the baggage and all the things about women that Ted brings with him and sitting on his right is Strom Thurmond, a a segregationist senator from the South and old time racist. He's friends with all of them. He's colleagues with all of them. As he reminded us during the campaign. (laughs) Well, exactly. But I mean, this is, this is, he was raised up by the Senate after the death of his wife and he was the youngest senator uh, uh, elected. He goes in, he, he doesn't want to do it. He wants to stay home with his boys. They convince him to go, it's Richard Nixon time. You know what I mean? It's a, they need a Democrat in there. And it was the old segregationists who put him under their wing, who brought him in and said, hey, kid, they, they put him on the right committees. They moved him around. And, and the Senate was a boys club. Uh, it, it still is in a lot of ways, but it's nothing like it was in the, you know, the 70s, 80s and 90s, where Joe Biden ruled the roost at some moment. Part of that mix is something I have to carry in my head as I do it. So I can be critical of what we know now, certainly. Uh, I can even try to remember what I was thinking when I watched what Anita Hill was going through. And then I have to try to factor into what did Anita Hill think? And, And all the people that were around her bringing her forward, especially the women. This was a big moment for women. Uh, after the Anita Hill hearings, uh, I think five women win uh, uh, seats in the United States Senate. Uh, Carol Mosley Braun, uh, uh, lots of women come. It's the year of the woman, they call it. So there was a lot of energy going on all around it. And, uh, and of course, 
uh, women who've been reporting it and reported on it at the time uh, just uh, uh, were extremely useful to me. So I try to fill in all those gaps, my own personal gaps, my white male gaps, my all the other things, and try to judge Joe based on what it was like at the time and what it really means uh, and what happened uh, there that can tell us something about taking the measure of, of Biden and how he is and how he reacts in the face of such intense criticism, which he surely deserved after the Anita Hill. He turns and says, we're not going to be like this anymore. I was uncomfortable sitting there in judgment of a woman, especially a black woman under these circumstances and a black man. He's kind of in a funny place there. Democrats were in a funny place, especially once Clarence Thomas said this is a high tech lynching. Now Democrats are being accused by a black uh, Supreme Court justice of, uh, of uh, lynching, uh, all coded words, everything intense. So what does Biden do? He goes and finds Carol Mosley Braun up in Illinois. She's just one first black woman elected to the Senate. And he pursues her and convinces her to uh, join the committee, the Judiciary Committee, uh, uh, and, uh, and Dianne Feinstein to do the same thing. So that he's immediately uh, trying to fix what was a big problem that he knew he had and he didn't know how to act and he acted the wrong way, apologizes, goes to work and fixing it and tries to persevere. One of the things uh, that uh, folks, my friends on the right and conservatives and uh, Republicans and, and some progressives actually will often criticize Joe Biden or say to me, well, he said this, uh, why doesn't he get the same flack that if somebody else said it? And I have regularly just said, often because he's wrong and he, he acknowledges he's wrong and then he apologizes and then he leans in and tries to fix it. And one of those incidents um, is when Joe Biden was running for president in 2008 uh, and he came under fire when he called a uh, fellow candidate, uh, Senator then Senator Barack Obama, quote, the first mainstream African-American who, who is articulate and bright and clean and a nice looking guy, end quote. Of course, um, that comment today and then would be political suicide. But for Biden, it actually uh, turned into a relationship he was able to form with soon to be President Obama. Let's take a look at a clip. Barack Obama is projected to be the next president. Senator Barack Obama of Illinois. He turned a political crisis into a relationship and became vice president. He had already squared away in his mind that he understood that Barack Obama was president, Joe was vice president, and Joe understood the job of vice president and, and, uh, and wore it well. In the Obama White House, Biden brought with him something the president didn't have, relationships in Congress spanning decades. Those were his recently former colleagues, and he knew that he could call them, and they would take his call, and that he could go and thrash issues out with them uh, with a degree of comfort that President Obama didn't have because he hadn't known them as long as Vice President Biden. Biden became Obama's trusted partner. The real question isn't, what thing did you do if you're vice president? The real question is, how much influence did you have? And I think. Biden understands power and leveraging power. I think he had a genuine relationship with Obama. They spent a lot of time talking. But I, I think he was a very influential vice president uh, in that way and, a, and an extremely loyal vice president. In return, Obama bestowed on Biden something special, a kind of political sainthood they called the Obama halo. Joe Biden has the Obama halo. Everybody knows that. That is the cleansing of Joe Biden and everything that may have happened. And there's such a great irony that someone who was the architect of the 94 crime bill and a white man of this age, when I mean, you think about Anita Hill, his crutch, his, the reason for his success, is a black man with a funny name who's kind of skinny from Hawaii by way of Kansas.
You know, I've been I've been trying to uh, find the person who said it because I keep quoting him. But a, a African American lawmaker or activist in South Carolina said during the campaign that the reason, one of the reasons Joe Biden is so popular within the Black and African American community is because he's Scotty Pippen to Obama's Magic Johnson, right? And that you have a white man of a certain age who had been running for president, who was more than willing to uh, honor and serve the first black uh, president of the United States. So as he enters his second day in office as president, does Biden still have the Obama halo? Um, I, I, I think so. Certainly uh, it didn't hurt to pick Kamala Harris as your vice president, make a, an historic choice there. Uh, also a courageous choice and, and in a way a symbolic choice that's beyond the, her, the fact that she's a woman and her, her racial uh, makeup. She's, she, she took him on. She beat him up in that first debate. She really hammered him. Uh, and she's a friend of his, was a friend of his son, Bo's. Uh, I think he thought of her as a, as a really close friend of his. Uh, and, uh, and she really hammered him. And, uh, uh, for about busing, and uh, and he took it, uh, and it wasn't easy for him to do. It was his first debate, and he just got killed. He looked terrible. His campaign was already in a tailspin. I think uh, the fact that he picked her uh, after South Carolina had validated him because of largely because of the black vote, uh, Jim Clyburn delivered that. Uh, he, he, you know, it was it was an amazing uh, thing he was doing, which was just saying, "I want somebody." who doesn't agree with everything I say. And if that person is black and female, even better. And, it, and we'll keep the halo shined up and going for as long as we possible can, uh, possibly can. We will see. It's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to write executive orders. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a promise I know he's made. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are hoping that they will see a real difference. And I think that's his intention and certainly hers. Uh, uh, whether together they can make the wheels work, especially in the face of a 50-50 and, uh, and the power of Mitch McConnell. That's, uh, I don't have my crystal ball with me, but I think uh, that's the, it doesn't take one to know that that's going to be a big problem. In the, right. In um, the you, meant, you mentioned Bo, um, Biden, his, his late son. And, um, you know, as, as I'm talking to my uh, young adult daughter about Joe Biden's story, I often get to a point where she just says, this is so sad the story of Joe Biden's life. I mean, all of us have personal tragedy, but Joe Biden's tragedies just seem to follow a heartbreaking sort of pattern. You know, most people know by now he lost his first wife and daughter in a car crash, and Bo and Hunter were also uh, seriously injured in the crash as well. And then his son, Bo, who has been often referred to as Biden 2.0, um, died of, of brain cancer. And um, you can see, especially watching your film, the evolution of Joe Biden uh, into this uh, empathy first sort of human being. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering um, just what kind of poetry is it that at a point where we're in America facing 400,000 people dead from coronavirus, millions impacted by it, uh, economic crisis, that Joe Biden is the empathy that the nation seemed to think was right for this moment? It's a really good question and a really fascinating culmination in lots of ways of our story. Um, it is, he, he did not spend his lifetime trying to become a grief counselor to a nation or to anybody else. Uh, he had a lot of grief. Uh, it didn't always go well in terms of his uh, opportunity to get it better. I think he wanted to be president because he had all these ideas that were floating around in his head. He was sort of surfing the, the waves of politics. He didn't really have a strong ideology, didn't really have any policies that were the Joe Biden policies. And it hadn't worked. He'd never gotten more than 1% in any national election. And we come up to this one. And is it possible that maybe he was the only person who could beat uh, Donald Trump at this moment? Uh, and uh, certainly the only Democrat that was in that field. A lot of people think that. And one of the reasons that he wins, a lot of people believe, is because of uh, uh, voters perceiving in Biden that he would be, in fact, the grief counselor 
that the nation needs at a moment like this. Yes, there are lots of other problems too, and he knows how to pull the levers of government. But this idea, and I think he has slowly come to accept that as a big part of his, not only his personality, but who he is in the world, going to all those funerals, having all that personal grief and knowing it and being able to talk about it in a very, as you say, empathetic way. We, we center it and we watch that trajectory inside our film as one of the things in his life method that he's gathered, which is that ability to reach out and talk to people at moments of great loss and grief. Now, whether he can do that from the Oval Office with all the cameras and all the pressures and all the other things, can he take time? Can he be compelling and convincing? That's certainly what he hopes he can be. And uh, you, you'll see it symbolically, but I have a feeling that it's really who he is um, by now in life. And it's not political shtick. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's who the man is at 78 years of, uh, of age. You know, I was uh, very struck when I was covering um, the New Hampshire primary up in New Hampshire and was at the state convention and um, Senator Elizabeth Warren comes running down the street and uh, Senator Bernie Sanders before the heart attack is running around the, inter the inside of the, the uh, arena. And Joe Biden didn't look as vital to me as they did, even though they're in the same you know age group. Um, and at you know this the same time though uh, he had this star quality <laughs> that they did not have right this yeah. they each have obviously their own types of charisma but but he definitely had a different type of charisma and um, I, you allude to it in the film but the sort of hostage video um, that when they left <laughs> New Hampshire when he lost New Hampshire uh, that they made leaving sort of in the dark of night um, but I'm just wondering if the coronavirus and the restrictions on campaigning in if if you think it helped joe biden the candidate become a more disciplined candidate because the the joe biden we see now out even during the the weird debates that we had i found him to be more on message and more disciplined than he was at the beginning of the campaign there's no question that it cut to his advantage trump is an amazing uh, he's a machine, a campaigning machine. That's where he gets his power, feeds from the crowds, flies in, gets off the plane, does his whole kind of rock star thing, if that's not an overuse of rock star for applied to Donald Trump. But certainly the noisy, the power, the the, the lust of his base, uh, that he loved that and he, he needed it. Uh, Joe Biden never had that base. No, Joe Biden was never going to be able to compete on that level and doesn't certainly doesn't have the energy level for it. Um, so yeah, I, I no doubt got that way for him. It also imposed a certain level of restraint. Joe Biden has a temper. Joe Biden has, has popped off many times, famously said things, inappropriate things, a la the, the Barack Obama statement. So having to be in his basement, being around Jill and his old campaign friends and associates for all these years, I think it imposed, and his grandkids, I think it imposed a certain calm, a kind of bliss a little bit. Yes, he was hungry. Yes, he's an ambitious politician. Yes, he wants it real badly. But somehow the, the process kept him home, kept him off the half-empty auditorium uh, uh, things that would have happened to him if he'd been running against Trump. Trump, Trump, I mean, it's hard. It, we'll never know whether if there wasn't coronavirus, how badly Trump would have slaughtered him. Uh, but uh, uh, Joe Biden, after 50 years, deserves some kind of a metaphysical break. And, uh, and he, uh, I, when, yeah. I was when I was interviewing people around the film, I kept saying, this is the luck of the Irish. Uh, that, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing, but it's the luck of the Irish that uh, and Biden's people really, they all, you know, they all think that's true in this case. I mean, certainly on its merits, you could say, well, he's a better candidate, going to be a better president. But winning is everything you have to do first. And uh, he hadn't won before. He had no national following at all. And suddenly here he is, President of the United States. So something had to cut right. All right, Michael Kirk, thanks for taking time to join us today. I want to just tell folks, whether you know Joe Biden or don't, definitely watch Frontline's President Biden. Very enjoyable and educational and really will set the tone for the next four years. And we'll check in with you, obviously, as you make more films 
and you keep us up to date. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Good to see you. Thank you, Sue. Great to see you too. Thanks everybody for watching on social media. Lunch Hour Live will be back. I appreciate you watching. Stay safe. Thanks.